What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Concord Health Podcast. I'm your host, Louis Latuka, and today we've got, well, the word is often overused, but we have got a true legend of powerlifting on today. And, you know, people throw that word around lightly and you get these, you know, younger guys or, or lifters that have been lifting five, ten years and they, they hit world records and, you know, they're instantly like a legend. But, you know, to me, this guy is a true legend and we got Dave Ricks on today who is just like the ultimate legend of the sport right now, in my opinion. And um, Dave, Dave, how you doing? Let's, uh, let's get to you, man. What's going on? Thank you for, for inviting me to your podcast. I, I love doing this type of conversation about lifting and fitness and nutrition uh, because, uh, I mean, this would be, I would do this in my day job if I didn't have to pay the bills, but, but this is you know, one of my passions in terms of what I do, and I, I love it. I just, and so thank you for the invite, and I, I love to have this conversation. <laughs> Pleasure, man. Um, I mean, I'm excited to have you on. Um, we're going to get so much great information out of you today, not only for myself, but for the listeners as well. You really can't beat years of experience like you've got. And it's, um, yeah, it's exciting. So what, I mean, I mean, starting off, Dave, listen, we're, we're going to go into your your current state of affairs and, and how you're getting on, et cetera. But in this particular episode, I want to take it straight back, like to the beginning, because you've got such a long history. Now, I had a look on open powerlifting, and I believe... Unless I'm wrong, your first competition was in 1981. Is that correct? That's a, when you were 21 years old? That, that, that is correct, yes. <laughs> Man, so 1981, I wasn't even born, first of all. And uh, I mean, what, what, I mean, it's so different. Powerlifting is so different to what it is now. You see all the, some of it good, some of it bad, but all the nonsense you see on Instagram. Um, there's a lot, a whole host of information on YouTube now. Um, raw powerlifting has become a much bigger thing um, in the last, what, 10, 11, 12 years. And, you know, I presume it wasn't, it wasn't such a huge mainstream thing back then. So where did it start for you? What got you into it? Were you, you know, were you training, were you training for a sport originally? Or was it, was powerlifting, you know, you saw powerlifting and that was what you wanted to do? Well, I, you know, I, I went to the Naval Academy and it's a military service school. Uh, and so they had a Protestant club. And so I was busy, you know, uh, you know, in my early years at the school. And then my senior year, I had some more free time. And I was a you know, simple high school athlete, played football and did a lot of body stuff, but I really never did, never knew anything about powerlifting. And so in the fall of my senior year, uh, when I had some more free time, uh, so a friend of mine said, hey, Dave, you, you know, the powerlifting club, they do this, this squat, bench, and deadlift thing. I think you could you could do something with this. And I said, well, I don't know. So let me try it out. And so uh, they had their strength coach, the co- which, uh, guy who was a former SEAL team commander, and his big, and he was big on going heavy all the time. And so very quickly, I, I adapted to it, which is squatting and, and benching, and of course, the deadlifting. And so I was able... Uh, I think in February and March, uh, my first meet was the Marin State Championship, and I qualified for the Collegiate National. And this was, okay. you know, all you had was gym. So you had very simple squat suits, and you had a simple knee wrap. And then I went to the, Cle- the Collegiate National that year in Coonstown, Pennsylvania, in 1981. And I, I took third, and I, and I squatted somewhere in the mid five, but the you know, mid of mid the five, but the, the top guys was, you know, they're right from Texas. They're squatting in the mid 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 600s, uh, benching you know, over four. That, that's at 165, and so uh, and uh, so I graduated. So when you go to service academy, you start your military career. And so I never thought about you know doing more more in the sport. But in the military, no matter where you go, all the military bases have a, a fitness facility, a gym you can train. So I always trained, uh, and it kind of just worked out a little bit. You know, the, and then uh, in the mid 1980s, uh, wait, yeah, mid 1980s, I got stationed in Hawaii, and I connected with a power gym, and they really told me how to really train for power me. I did some local meets, uh, and and I did okay. And then uh, in Hawaii, I went to uh, California, and that's where I learned really more about the sport, and I got exposed to uh, 
uh, drug-free part of the thing, ADFPA at that time. And that's where my numbers started being, I said, look at the ADFP number, I said, shoot, I could be competitive at the local and national level. Now, this yeah. is local New California. And after the, I think the second or third state championship in California, one of the guys pulled me aside, the mic director said, you know, Dave, you could, your numbers, you could be a, a national champion. I never thought about it. And I said, <laughs> okay. It kind of recalibrate what I need to look look at. And plus I learned, I got some points how to train, you know, in terms of how to work my strength. And so I trained uh, for the, my first national championship, uh, I think it was uh, in the late 1980s. And I uh, took second, you know, my first one. And uh, uh, so it gave me the fire to keep keep working harder. So the second year it was in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. I remember this like yesterday. And my numbers were close enough and uh, Martin Beavers was the top guy, 165, great guy, great lifter. And so it was the day before the, um, yeah, day before the, the, the weigh-in, and I was a little heavy, and so I didn't, yeah, I wasn't doing my nutrition the way it should have been. I was, I was always uh, fat 165 and trying to starve myself right before the meet, and <laughs> it came back to bite me. Uh, so I was still a little heavy, so I didn't eat the 24 hours before. And then we weigh in, and then, you know, you can put your numbers in as you, as you weigh in, and he was left, he was opening up at a certain weight. And I said, well, if he's gonna open that heavy, I should open that heavy. Oh man. Wrong, <laughs> wrong plan. And so, so, so we get into the meet day and they start, and I really like the, you know, the second group in the afternoon, but they're behind schedule. And so I didn't pay attention. And all of a sudden I said, no, we're gonna, you know, the, this, it, we're gonna stick to the schedule. You guys need to warm up. And so the warm-ups didn't go very well. And I took my opening left and it felt like a ton of bricks. And uh, I didn't go deep enough. Uh, opening left, second left, I didn't go deep enough. Okay, third one, okay, I'll sink it. And it crushed me. I, they had to take the weight. And so and the other piece of this was my dad, you know, he, my parents live in Ohio. So my dad drove up to see me, the first time he seen me left, and I bombed after the squats. Oh. And, and I told my dad, I know you want to see the rest of this competition. However, I just came here to watch this because. In my heart, you know, I, I could have either won it, win it, or at least take second place. I can't bear to watch the rest of this. So let's let's go get some knee and, uh, and call it a day. And so I was um, uh, really just, you know, I don't say I don't say frustrated, but disappointed how I did. And I wouldn't say I was going to quit, but I I was gonna I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And my dad said, "Hey, you work too hard. You just got to reflect a little bit and and kind of recalibrate." And that's what I did. And and uh, I did, and then then I came back and I had a very good meet and uh, and did very well next nationals. And so throughout my career, I've only bombed three twice, three times. Each of the time, it was my fault. But that first one was, ooh, that that was that was uh, thunderstruck because I I had high expectations, trading everything else, and like you set yourself up and then you're not even close. And it's really my fault not training right, you know, not eating right. And then also not not being consistent to in terms of what I picked the numbers, and so uh, so those lessons are hard lessons. You learn them very well. You don't forget them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the time, those type of lessons are, are, are almost horrible at the time. You know, it's such a humbling experience, and it mentally it can swallow you. But I think what we don't realise, and you know, I've had several lessons like that through, throughout my sporting career in boxing and whatnot. The you don't see it at the time, but if you're, for example, you were clearly doing well at that point up until that stage, but certain things probably weren't optimized in your lifting, like you're saying, like your diet, like your weight cutting, maybe your training methods. And when you take a big loss or a big humbling experience like that, I feel that it makes you take a step back and review everything to take three or four steps forward. Yeah, and, and so and you have to really humble yourself to kind of be willing to do that and not blame everybody else, and and that's that's a hard thing to do, and uh, and uh, and so I, I that and so each time I you know uh, I did uh, I bombed myself, I, did, I bummed out, I had to step back, and so it, it actually helped me to kind of be more focused and say, okay, I'm not going to let this be the last be my last you know mark on the sport i said i need to go out you know better than that and so yeah. it drove me to be better and so the last one which was unique also unique it was the world it was the world masters raw championship it was in canada 
Uh, I was a top guy going in. Um, this was uh, okay. This was 18. That'd be 16, 17, uh, 18, 2018. Uh, and all I had to do was get my opening squad in. Uh, and I was way ahead in terms of the in terms of you know the registered numbers. And it was 644 opener. And it wasn't the weight. It was just that mechanically, whatever one reason, I didn't. You know, the judges was I'm not going to win the judges. But I didn't give them a good reason to give me, you know, the two white lights. And so, uh, and each time I thought I, I hit it, especially my third squad, I thought I, I hit it, and it was just, it just, the judges, I didn't get the call. And and so I didn't, yeah. You know, so I didn't just you know, say, okay, I'm not gonna do the finish to me. I benched, I hit a, you know, a technical world record in the bench, and also a world record in the deadlift uh, at for my age and weight class. And if I got a squad in, that'd have been, a, would have been a world record uh, for the M2. And so, uh, and I said, I, I cannot leave with bombing out of the world champ. That, I, I just can't do that. that. That That is not. And so I, I stepped back and kind of worked on, worked on my technique a little bit and came back and in 2018, you know, I, I did reasonably well and won the world championship uh, in Sweden. Uh, and so I didn't have, I didn't have a great day, but, but my, uh, each of my opening left was something I can get no matter what. And so that's what I did. And so uh but like so it so it uh so it, it's it's a it, we all have those unique you know lessons and journey. But for me it it, it helped me to kind of okay, I was pushing the limit to what my technique was until I had that, you know, you know, humbling experience. It didn't it, it, it didn't uh I, I wasn't willing to uh to uh to uh Challenge myself. I, I'll say that. Later. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's um, so so. It's amazing, isn't it? How even someone who's been competing and lifting as long as you you have, you could still bum out. Like you still have a bad experience. Like you know, not so long ago, and people think that you know it's maybe something that happens to less experienced lifters because they you know they they try and set an opener way too high or something like that. But you know, you just like you said have. Out of all the hundreds of great days you've had, you have one or two unique ones in there. So it, you know it can it can happen. I watched that that world actually in Sweden, and um, one thing I noticed, I, I remember watching you deadlift in that world, and I think maybe I want to say you hit like three thirty. We work in kilos over here, so around the three thirty kilo mark I might be right. But I remember you deadlifting in night trainers, and thinking. How can you deadlift in night trainers? It's like it goes against, it goes against like everything you were taught as a as a new lifter. I mean, is there any any reason for that, or it's just your thing? It doesn't really matter to you. Well, I mean, well, it's interesting because you're not the first person that, that really has picked up on that. They they, they call me the the, the Nike monster. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I have well, uh, and I've and I've and I've changed shoes here and there, but. I have, I have weak arches, and so I, you know, you know, in my late when I was in California, I was doing a sumo lift, pushing it, and then I tweaked my knee, and uh, and went to the chiropractor, and he says, "You got weak arches. You need to wear a shoe to have an arch support." Yeah. Uh, what happened when your knee collapsed? When your arch collapsed, and your knee kind of has a has a kind of kind of balance there, and that's where you. And so ever since then, I always try to lift with a shoe with an arch. And so, yeah, Nike is not idea because sometimes it's a little soft. But if, I, if I'm in the groove, I could, I could, I could stand up in anything. And yeah, so, sure. uh, and uh, but yeah, you get to look at what what works for you. And so uh, for me, the Nike works for me. And uh, uh, so I've I've worked with different shoes. But you 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 yeah, trust me, you're not the first person that picked up on this. So like, who is this guy, and, and why is he so? <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say, I definitely knew who you were, but I thought, man, he's pulling those numbers in night trainers. Maybe I need to get myself down to night town. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is this is where it's at. <laughs> so when when you when you started powerlifting, I still wanna wanna dial back a bit. Was it was it an initial thing? Did you did you play a lot of sports before that, before powerlifting? And when you started powerlifting, was it, did you realize you were strong straight away? You know, could you get a rough idea? Hmm, hang on, I'm quite good at this. 
Was it was it an immediate thing? No, no, you, you, that's a good point. I mean, I I was I played you know uh, you know high school football a little bit, and then and I played a little you know uh, football at the Naval Academy, you know, lightweight football. But I was always a good bencher, um, and so at that point, I you know even at one sixty five, I could bench three hundred, uh, even when I was in high school. So I always was a good bencher, but I never done any we never done any leg lifts into the leg training. And so squatting, deadlifting was, uh, was I had never done any of that. And so uh, but even you know when I when I did that first you know collegiate national and took third, my numbers were nowhere near the guy top two guys. And so I called it a day and uh, I said I'll train a little bit, but but I'll stay in shape. But I never thought about competing at that level. And because at that time your know, information was it wasn't like it today in terms of social media and everything else. USA powerlifting was. You know, Policy USA was a magazine. And you look at the top guys in that sport, your weight class, top 100, they're doing some massive numbers. And so I, so I wouldn't, that wouldn't be on my radar. But when I got to, um, uh, to California, did ADFA, you know, drug free lifting, and realized, hey, and I was basically the top guys in Cal, I was at the top level in California. And I said, okay, I, I think I could be competitive. At a state, even at a national level, and that's when it, it, I started looking at. Well, if I'm going to do this, I need to train the right way and prepare myself for that level of competition. And so I started on work on the nutrition in terms of supplements because I never been, I never knew anything about supplements because I never knew anybody who took supplements. And so, and when I was in California, I like you know found a supplement company uh, and started working on that. And for a natural lifting, supplements, you know, some people say they're good or bad or they don't believe in them. But for our natural left, right, I think I, I firmly believe in that because when you're training as an elite athlete, even though you may have great nutrition in terms of breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that nutrition only prepares you to do a- average training, you know, just, you know, maintenance level performance. If you yeah. want to train to be like on a NASCAR circuit, high performance, well, that nutrition is only going to get you a certain level. Those supplements, not by themselves, but plus regular nutrition, and a supplement will help you maintain to work at a high performance level uh, because you got to put that type of fuel. Like if you're if you get any car at any car and you put regular gasoline, yeah, the, the, the car will roll, but it's not going it's not going it's not going to drive at that high level. Same thing yeah. for your body. And so I I use the analogy that your body is a high performance engine. If you're just staying in shape, no big deal. Then you really don't need the supplement. But if you start training at a very high level over an extended period of time, we talk about I'm doing an eight-week cycle, well, then, then that's what you need to do. And so anytime I get back and really start training, the first thing I start doing is start taking my supplements to start feeding my body at that level. So when I start pushing myself, my body can respond at the optimal level. Yeah. Uh, and so for, and that's, I think, it's key uh, for a natural lifter. But the other thing is how, how to train smart. Because you know you can't walk in and hitting those high heavy numbers uh, every day in the gym because it just ain't going to happen. And so, how do you make make regular progression over our you know, six eight week period? Because every training cycle builds upon another training cycle. And so, some people get enamored by hitting that max lift in the gym or hitting that you know making a big gain in a, a short training cycle. It, you know, yeah, you might do that, but if you keep you know pushing your numbers especially a, a young lifter, eventually you're, you're going to overtrain and you'll get an injury. Yeah. Uh, so my, you know, even though I'm a little older and that weight has, you know, I'm not 165 anymore, I'm 200, uh, I'm still handling, you know, decent numbers in the gym. Now, I don't like that, like I did that thing in September, 705. I don't go to the gym every week, every every Friday and hit that in the gym. <laughs> That ain't gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that, that 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 was just absolute craziness. And I know, I know, t- probably almost everybody listening to this when I put it out is is gonna will know about what you done. Um, what was it three twenty for a triple? Um, at sixty one years old is just just an outrageous squat. It really is crazy. Um, and if you don't, you need to go and check out the video because it was just madness. Um. <laughs> I was tired just watching it, to be honest. But I, I, I want to get to that because a, a lot of people are going to be going, oh, I mean, what supplements do, do you take, Dave? And what nutrition do you do? Because what I hear a lot, and I'm sure you've heard a ton of this, is people saying 
things like powerlifting for me is I just want to get in and get out. I want to smash a world record. I don't care if it kills me. I don't care if I break my body. And that's it. And, you know, the, the my approach is so much more aligned with, like, you and how long you've been lifting for and some of the some some of the more unbelievable lifters who have no real time limit or ceiling of what they can lift or how long they can go for. And it's just whether your body can do it for that period of time, you know, if you can keep going. And to, to be able to keep doing that, you, you know, you need some luck, but also sensible management of your food, your supplements, your training, your prehab, your rehab, the whole works. So, I mean, what? let's talk about supplements because... You just spoke about that, and well, what, what, I mean, what supplements do you currently take? I know supplements are individual to each person, and not, you know, something that works for you might not work for someone else. But I mean, what, what works for you, and how's that changed over the years, and what are you currently doing? Well, I, I, you know, like for right before I, right before I left, uh, I take a mixture of pre-workout, pre-benching aminos, and concrete creatine. Uh, and the, the whey protein is basically very just basic. Didn't have all the other stuff in it. <laughs> okay, uh, and keep it real simple. Uh, branch chain aminos is good, you know, for uh, you know muscle repairing your muscle. And yeah. then for creatine, I've been a big proponent of the concrete creatine because it doesn't uh, cause the water weight gain for your kidneys. And so some creatine, you basically you have to cycle it because what it does, it taxes your kidneys, kidney yeah. function. And so you know, as you get older, that's, that's hard for your body. Uh, but uh, concrete creatine doesn't do that. You can take it almost indefinitely. Uh, and so that is part of my, you call it pre-workout. And I take it maybe an hour, an hour and a half before workout. And like when I compete, that's my that's my pre-workout. That's what I do after I weigh in. I don't take a meal, whatever. That's that's what I eat. So, and then uh, in the morning, I'll take, you know, different, you know, I'll take a, a, a bench. I'll take a big complex, you know, in terms of all the, B vitamins, you know, uh, in one pill, there it's like it's called a B complex. It has besides B12, it has all the B vitamins, uh, has it helps for your energy. Then C complex in terms of uh, uh, other thing of that the C, the C series. Um, what else? Take uh, glucosamine chondroitin, great for your joints. Uh, Eric, I just started taking that the last year or so. I heard read about that, and that's great for your joints. Um, what else? Okay. Uh, okay. Turmeric, uh, B2 complex. Uh, so th those are the basics. Uh, oh, I take um, omega-3, which is great for the heart. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so then you add in the whey protein, the BCA, the concrete, you're at eight right there. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so, the, so the, the ones I just read out, the three, I take them like in pills, like when I you know, either uh, first thing in the morning when I, before I go to work or during, during lunch time when I take a lunch break. Uh, and then eat, right before I work out, if I'm eating workout, that's what I take. Uh, but, but, but those are, are kind of like my, my, we call my basic fundamentals. Uh, that and uh, uh, Primavera, I mean, Concrete has a pre-workout also uh, uh, that has, uh, which is really good. So those are the type of things. And I can send you the list so you can broadcast that in terms of what I take. But, uh, but those are, I think, are fundamentals in terms of if you're, if you're competing at that level, then you need to make sure your nutrition and how you prepare your body is so, so huge. Because just think about it, if you're pushing basic 80 plus percent over the last four, last four weeks, uh, if you're not fishing for a natural athlete, and that is so, so huge. And so I've been fortunate enough, even though I've been uh, doing this, you know, uh, you're like 37 like that. I've been doing this longer than you've been alive, which is kind of scary. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. but I have not had any major knee injuries. I've taken my back here and there and, uh, and some minor injuries, but nothing catastrophic requires surgery. But, but I, I, I firmly believe that it helps me all uh, in terms of helping me with my life journey in terms of fitness. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm a big fan of supplements myself. Um, and I do feel a difference, you know, e even if, I don't know if some of it is slightly psychological, it, it, you know, certain supplements definitely do make a difference, and and it's important. You can't just grind yourself into the floor through training, because 
if you're not, you know, your body needs a higher nutrient need. If, if you're training hard, we're not just like normal people. So, so I am, I'm a big believer in that. And um, nutrition, let's talk about that. So what, what do you do nutrition wise? Because I know you said in the earlier days, there was no real thought behind your nutrition. But I mean, how's that evolved? Well, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't get, you know, like a bodybuilder where you got to weigh everything because you're working about muscle size and everything else. But I try to eat, you know, pretty, pretty simple. You know, I try to eat, you know, in the morning, you know, probably some oatmeal in the morning or bacon and eggs if, if I feel you know, in the middle of the week. But lunch is pretty simple because I, I, I have a day job like everyone else does, most of us. And so it's really just, you know, a t- turkey sandwich or a leftover from dinner. Uh, with doesn't drink a lot of water and some fruit, like a fruit cup, meaning basically a grapefruit cup that I get from the, the local uh, you know, big lot store. In the evening is normally it's uh, either chicken, you know, chicken or fish. Uh, once in a while we might do a little bit of red meat, but that's not on the weekend. But chicken or fish, either grilled or whatever, uh, and some rice and some vegetables, and that, that's basically it. So it's not, you know, it's not that, uh, and, and of course it's some vegetable, but it's not. It's not that complicated, but I think you just have to make sure you, you keep it, you know, uh, good in terms of, you know, in terms of nutrition, in terms of meat that you eat, in terms of, uh, in terms of protein, and make sure you drink a lot of water and stay hydrated as you as you do stuff. Um, and I think so. So if you're trying to drop weight, then it gets a little more detailed because you want to, you know, take in less calories than than you're burning, and that's that's a whole another conversation. But if you yeah. just basically, I'm, I'm good at my weight and want to maintain what I got, then it becomes a very simple, simple conversation. Yeah. So, so you you go by, if I'm right in saying, mainly by feel. Um, in terms of, um, you know, you don't, you know, you don't track it on an app. You don't look at any specific grams of protein or anything like that. You just you're eating good quality foods and just you know what's right for you by this stage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I know a friend of mine. Uh, here I'm training locally, and he dropped, I think he got almost 20 pounds, but he had an app that, that tracked it all. And, and and so and so he knew exactly what he needed to take, whatever. Uh, and I'm right now I'm like uh, maybe five to ten pounds above my you call my competition weight. And I do, I can drop that basically just just monitoring my intake and just you know and working it that way. But if I want to drop some stanch weight, then I would definitely do some one of these new, you know, these new apps that we can track everything and scan it in and you, you it measure everything you're taking and it makes it more, actually more easier versus trying to do it by feel. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It really depends upon what your goals are. So yeah, I, I, I hear you. I hear you on that one. I mean, to be honest, sometimes I, I've, ex- I've, I've messed around with apps before and it's like after a week, I'm forgetting to put something in one day and then the next day I'm like, oh man, I just, I can't be bothered. I know what my body needs roughly. You know, I, I've had years and years of experience dropping weight and cutting weight for fights and now for, for lifting, for comps. And it's just like, for some people it works and they're really meticulous about it. My partner, she lifts and she competes and she, she you know, she tracks her food. But for me, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm not the best of it, to be honest. But it definitely works for some people, for sure. So what um no, I can care because some go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 go, 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 please, please go ahead. <clears throat> no, no, you are right about those apps because it, are are you are the app was working for you or you are you working for the app? And so Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's you true. also have a lot of on a plate. And so if it becomes like a chore, then it's really hard. And so uh yeah, well, you, you hit the nail on the head on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when you I was going to get back into the, and I'm going to keep referring back to the early days because what I'm trying to do is compare a lot of your early stuff to now and, and looking at the evolution, you know, using the, from your own experience. So when you first started training, you said, you know, the coach back then was all about heavy and hard. Uh, sorry, hard and like often, basically. So when you first started off, how often were you training? Was it, you know, five, six, seven days a week? Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. So when I, you know, I just back because of my physical limitation, I went to I was about a five day a week, but I had to do a light day squat, heavy day squat, then light day bench, heavy day bench. And so that translated to like a four day work week, four day training cycle. And then you had a deadlift, five days. 
And so I fell into that that framework because I, I had to have a those light days to let my body recover. So you know, Monday was a deadlift day, and and then Tuesday was a light bench day, Wednesday light squat day, and Thursday heavy you know heavy bench day, and then Friday heavy squat day. But so that was just how I would you know that's how I came to my training evolution. And everyone's a little different, but the the biggest change for me was this periodization thing, where you work at a lower percentage, and you work at a higher volume. And so you work with eight, you know, to the you know, top set of eight, and then you transition to sets of five, uh, you know, 85%. And then you work, you know, to a top set of three at, you know, close to 95% uh, over an eight to 10 week period. And that for me, as a natural lifter, uh, that that was like, that was a game changer. Because yeah. what it does, it allowed me to uh, work up to a certain weight, you know, in terms of capacity, and then start at the beginning again, and not lose confidence that I won't get back to that weight again. That the work I did at, you call that 74%, will translate to, after eight week period, to that heavier weight. I just had to be confident that my body will, will adjust after seven, eight weeks to that heavier weight. It wasn't if like, I'll lose the muscle memory and I will never hit that weight again. And, and so once I realized that this, that, that will work, then okay, well, I'm good. Okay, now I just need to, is to see how you know how would you know change the numbers a little bit if I if I if I get stronger. Yeah. So so it, it, that's that's the method you currently use. That that's how you're training now. That, that is correct. And so yeah, of course the equipment change in terms of you know in terms of you know equip lifting and then and I was equip lifter until 2014, and yeah. I did a, a couple of days before that, but nothing. You know I would I would dabble. To the meet here and get back to equip lifting, uh, and then after that meet in 2014, it was the Arnold. Uh, I did okay, but I had a very great training cycle and didn't have a good meet. Only got my opening squat in and my opening deadlift in, but I had trained to hit almost a almost 800 squat uh, and, and uh, at the Arnold uh, as a equip lifter in in, uh, in my 50s, early 50s. It just it just um, I just had a, a I just couldn't get my open in and finally got one in. But I had doubled single 780, uh, I don't know the keto, but 780 pounds in training. Uh, this is in Georgia. And um, and just it just had an off day. And so my body's a little beat up. And I said, let me just take some time off. And then right after that, I had a crit, I had a job change, the move. And so it was almost nine months before I really got back in the gym to in a different location. And so I wasn't sure I was going to compete against it. Well, maybe just call it a career, job change, whatever. Uh, and then all of a sudden, after a while, as I got into a good commercial gym, started working on the weights again, I got the bug again. And I was like, yeah, I, I don't know why, but I said, I want to do something. And I said, well, I'm not going to do the quick thing because I'm not into it. I don't, I'm not, it's not a power gym close by. But I said, I think I could do this raw lifting, but I think I'd be just a casual raw guy. Yeah. And, and, uh, and in Maryland, there's a, there's a uh, coach, is Matt and Susie Garrett. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're just some great folks. They've coached some world champions, and, and Susie she's a world champion herself. And so they had a local meet. Uh, this is July of, uh, yeah, July of 2015. And I said, could I, could I, this is only for new lifters. I said, could I do some token lifts for as a national lifter? You, to qualify for the nationals, because I've been out of it for a while, around national. You had to do a token lift. I said, I just want to do some token lift and call it a day. I said, well, uh, and this is like five weeks before the meet, <laughs> six weeks before the meet. <laughs> and and uh, and Matt said, yeah, you can you can be a, you can come in as a token guest lifter, uh, but however, you need to push yourself a little bit because if they know that you're there, they want you to do something. I said, but Matt, I got five weeks. He said, that's not my that's not my problem. That's your problem. And so <laughs> uh, so he was joking, but he he gave me a setup. So. I had only been squatting barely in the mid 400 pounds and pulling the mid 400 pounds and barely benching 250. So, so this meet was like mid July. I squatted 515, which is 2.5, maybe yeah, two, maybe 230 kilos. Uh, benching barely 300. I don't know what kilos that is, but barely 300, maybe 150, 140 something, yeah. and pulling um, 245 kilos. And so. So that was that was in uh, July of 2015, and so I said, "Well, okay, now I qualify." And I, I felt pretty good getting back in the game, and I started myself in this whole type of thing. 
said, well, let me see now the, the, um, the Nationals, Raw Nationals was in uh, September in Pennsylvania. And so I said, let me see what I, I was either going to, know I do the Open and the Masters. And I said, let me see what the Open numbers are. You guys won the last year and uh, there's some big numbers in terms of the top lifters. And I said, well, let me plug in the numbers that need to be training wise in order to get that. And it said, it ain't going to happen. So I competed just as a, as a, um, as a master lifter. So in September, uh, I squatted in an unofficial world record route in terms of masters. I think I squatted, um, I think over six, pulled uh, maybe 280 kilos and benched an unofficial world record, um, four or seven pounds, which is, uh, that's kind of what it was. But that was unofficial world record, uh, master world record. Uh, and uh, uh, I said, okay. So now, so I did okay. Now it is is uh, June of 2016. This was the in a training, and I and I got to a good power gym and start really pushing my training, raw training. Now it's June of 2016. This is the World Championships, and I had an opportunity. Based upon the training numbers, I saw what the raw open squat record was, and and so I knew I could do the. Uh, the one for my age and weight group. So I already knew that one. But I, as I started training, I said, hey, the open squat record ain't that far off. It was 670 and change. And uh, what, what weight class was that? Dave, the open one? That, that was one, before they did the 205, it was a 90, 90 kilo weight class. I think. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and I, so I told myself, if I get my first and second attempt, I'm going to put the world record on the bar. Wow. And, uh, and and first second went pretty good, and I said let's put the world let's put the break the world record on the bar for my third third attempt, and I was fortunate enough, blessed enough, and got that. So breaking the open squat record as an M2 lifter, that was that was 670 and change roughly. Uh, so, so you broke the open squat record at age 50. What? Uh, I had to pull it up. Age it was um, 2015, so I had to be. 56. That's, that, that, I mean, you realize how ridiculous that is. <laughs> I mean, that is, I know you're a humble guy, but that, that's outrageous. I, I can't, I actually can't imagine anyone doing that now. I mean, that may happen again, but that, that is absolutely ridiculous to, to break it at 56 years old. I mean, nothing to say it can't be done again, but I mean, that's pretty amazing to be honest. Well, then, let me add more to the story. So that was June of 2016. Now you you moved to, uh, I did the national, took second, to a couple of times, second to, uh, now it's the Arnold. Arnold in 2017. And uh, uh, I broke, I squatted 320 kilos on my second attempt. And uh, 320, no, 690, I think, my second attempt. And then I had a third attempt. And so I knew I'd done 705 at the Arnold, uh, I mean, I don't know, but the, at the Nationals. And I put 325 kilos on the bar because my parents was in the audience and I didn't know I was going to do another big meet. And that's when I broke the world record again. Wow. wow. And, then, and then six weeks later, I had just, I had pre committed to this a couple months prior to that. I didn't, I didn't think too much about it when I signed up for it. I was fortunate enough to go to Australia for an invitational meet. And I wasn't gonna go that heavy. I was because I after I did the Arnold, I was like, oh, there's no way I can go go heavy. And I I I got back in general. And uh, and once I got there, everybody's excited. We did some big things and big lifters. Uh, uh, Kadama was there, the big venture. And I said, oh, I got to do something. And so I was fortunate enough. I chipped the world record in Australia. Wow, wow. So in a period, a period of almost 12 months, I broke the world record three times. Wow. I mean, it's, that's just, just unbelievable, really. And I mean, that's not that long after being a raw lifter, right? That's only two, two years, roughly, into, into your raw lifting started? That, that, that is correct. So, so two years after I did my first meet, squatting barely, barely uh, maybe, maybe uh, 230 kilos, uh, a year, two years later, I'm doing 325 kilos. Crazy. I mean, it's just crazy, 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 crazy adaptability on your body. I mean, it's, it's just madness. I mean, you, you seem to have 
all the elements together, the work ethic, the mindset to train correctly for you and not to ego lift, but also, you know, the genetics, just, just every part. And, and it's amazing to see because it's producing some phenomenal viewing for all of us, really. And uh, long, long may it continue. Have you, I remember on your, so I was, I, I came on your seminar, your team longevity seminar back in, when was your first one? Maybe June, August? Yeah, June, yeah, June, yeah, June, yeah. Yeah, June, so your first one was in June. Um, and that was brilliant, by the way, guys. So keep an eye out for the next one, um, when the guys do it, when Dave and the guys do it, because I just got so much info as, as a novice lifter or even for a more experienced lifter, it's a must to, to jump on one of those seminars. But I remember you saying that you do your accessories split from your main lift. So is that right? You, you still do that. So you go in the morning, you do your main lifts, you go back and do your accessories. Was it? Yeah. And so and when I do my main lift, especially my deadlift, my squat, uh, especially on my heavy day, it takes a good, good hour plus. I mean, I do the stretching and then I then I warm up and then I work up to those heavy lifts. And so that's almost almost an hour into the gym. Yeah. And so um, and so I'm a pretty busy guy. And so what I do is normally I would do those you know heavy deadlifts and heavy squats eat as any workout. And I'm fortunate enough, less enough that that I'm close to a commercial gym and I wake up early and go to the gym at five o'clock and do all my call accessory lifts uh, early in the morning for about an hour. And so, and I don't go and 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 that's what the, you know, like you know, different bodybuilder. Bodybuilder, you kind of push yourself on, on everything because you're working on muscle size and and, and muscle, muscle growth. Uh, but for accessory lifting, I go basically uh, high volume to three sets of eight to ten for upper body and fifteen to twenty for uh, lower body. So the whole idea is basically you want to work on the actual. Uh, the, you know, in terms of the uh, the lift itself, in terms of the flexibility, you're not you're not going to point of failure on that because if you're going to point of failure on your accessory lift, in addition to your key lift, your your body, your central nervous system is going to go through the wall and it's just going to it just it's going to you know, blow a fuse. And so the only time I push my accessory, <laughs> my we call my in terms of my central nervous system is those three key lifts uh, when I go heavy. But when I'm doing an accessory lifting, uh, that's where my mindset is more relaxed, and I, you know, I know that the weight I put in the bar, I could, even if I'm having a, a you know, having a rough day, getting up in the morning, I know I can, I can ease into it. It's, it's not a big mental challenge to hit, you know, those, you know, those accessory lifting lifts uh, for, you know, three sets of eight or eight to ten or, or lower, lower level, fifteen to twenty, and call it a day. Now I will throughout my, if I'm doing a ten week cycle, maybe halfway through that cycle, I will maybe change the weight a little bit up the upper end a little bit uh yeah. because you scale a little bit because you start very easy when you start the training cycle and then all of a sudden you read into your body starts to adapt then i'll change i'll 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 uh, change the weight a little bit on those accessory lifts maybe halfway through my cycle but not like but not like on my main main list where every week you're you're changing the weight yeah. uh, because you increase the resistance uh, yeah so. that that's interesting i've been so badly i'm not anymore but in the past I just didn't get it. I've been so guilty of absolutely hammering the accessory lifts, like big lifts and going to like nine, 9.5 RPE. And after like six weeks, I'm, I'm just done. I, I can't hit any, I can't peak, like I'm absolutely finished. So, I mean, again, really interesting you say that. And do you, do you split the accessories up? So for example, say, on a Monday morning, you would do just your leg accessories, and then on the Wednesday or something, you'd do just upper body. How, how do you work it? Well, I mean, it, it's and and it really depends upon your schedule. And so I just spend it over the five days in terms of accessory lifting. And so, uh, but like the upper body, I split it over you know Monday and Tuesday and and Thursday. Yeah, you know, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday in terms of my upper body stuff because I've got uh, you know a dead up and my bench on on you know, Monday is my heavy dead up and Tuesday is my light bench. And so I do accessory work, I buy accessory work both those days. And then my leg that's split between Wednesday and Friday. And so the thing I try to do on Wednesday, in addition to my light squats, I try to do leg press. Uh, because I, you know, you know it's, it's not a heavy leg press with my light squats, so it's good. But trying to do heavy leg press after doing heavy squats, uh, it, it, 
sometimes it can be a little taxing for the lower, lower back if, you, if you're finishing heavy squat, then you jump to a leg press, and your body said, I know what you want to do, but yeah, my body said, did a shot. And so yeah. when I do that, when I did heavy leg press after a light squat, my body said, okay, let's do this. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hear you. I hear you there. Okay, cool. So, I mean, to go powerlifting for 41 years, roughly, takes some doing without getting injured. Now, off air, before we went live, you said never really had any major, major injuries. What do you put that down to? Because, I mean, I presume over the years, your, your prehab, your stretching, your mobility has probably got more advanced and better. I mean, what, what, I mean, what do you put that down to? Because I've seen some horrific injuries. And, and some of them are just bad luck, but some of them are, you know, people too hard, too heavy, no stretching, and they just drill their body into an injury. And well, I think right. that's probably, and you'll probably agree with me here, sorry, sorry to, to cut you off there, is that one of the biggest barriers to being a, a, a great powerlifter is, is injury. You know, if you keep taking time off for injuries, it's, it's really hard to get a bit of a run going. And I think most people would love to know what your kind of methods are to stay, you know, to keep that maintenance all the time. Well, I, well I've, I've learned, like anyone else does, over a period of time in terms of what you need to take care of your body. And so, so one of these is, uh, is um, uh, in terms of when you think you treat your body, chiropractic care, a chiropractor is worth their weight in gold. You know, when I first met a chiropractor, I had tweaked my knee from, from deadlifting and uh, and so I was pushing myself too hard. And he said, take your shoes off. And he says, why? Because I think it was my knee. He says, well, you're an engineer. I don't tell you how to be, do bridges, trust me. And he said, and he touched it my foot. My arch was really tender. And uh, I didn't realize that my arch had collapsed. And so he worked on out training for me. And he said, you need to wear a shoe with an arch because you're, you, get, you, get, uh, you get weak arches. And so once I did that, I realized that. But, but uh, when I, so from that point on, anytime I start a major cycle, uh, I live in various places. I always try to uh, get with a good little, get a sports chiropractor because they can, as you start working, training, start pushing your body, the body gets out of sync in terms of the, the framework, in terms of the skeletal framework. And so uh, you, you need that to kind of get readjusted. And I remember a good case in point was, uh, I was in Charleston, South Carolina. I was getting, I was in 181 weight class, training pretty hard, took about a year off, and I was pushing myself, and then I didn't realize, and when I got to my deadlift, I was pushing about maybe 310, yeah, 310 kilos, and as I start moving the bar from the floor, my left leg went completely numb. And so, and so of course, I dropped the bar, and I fell back, and I felt a tingling with my hip, left hip through my toes. I said, no, that's not good. So I went to my local chiropractor, and he says, you're, this were out of our alignment and your sciatic nerve got inflamed. That's when that's why you lost your know, strength in that one leg. Yeah. And so we do that. So he worked this one, he got my hips back on alignment, did some soft tissue work. And then I was like 10 days out from a from a major tournament. And I said, Well, should I just you know call day council tournament? I said, no, no, what you need to do is stay light, do a lot of flexibility. So I did all that and every day it felt better and better. So I flew out and they had a physical therapist at you know, like a major tournament worked my back a little bit. And so the morning of the tournament, I did my normal stretching. And the first time I didn't, I, I felt no, you know, stiffness. I said, well, maybe it's a good sign. So squats went pretty good. I think I squatted, you know, something over six, felt what it was, finished pretty good. Now we get to the deadlift. And so my second deadlift, I think was barely over six and I had the window locked up. And so I had a third attempt. Now the, the cautious me should have said, let's call it a day and, and do something <laughs> And I said, I'm feeling good. So let's put the number on the bar that I almost injured myself and I smoked it. And so uh, that, that reaffirmed that I need it. And so every, you know, so every time I do it, get into a major cycle, I, I do a, a checkup with a chiropractor beating cycle. And then near the end of the cycle, unless I have an injury or whatever, I have them re, re, get a retune up. And then the, the stretching and flexibility is so, so huge because now I take about 20 minutes to stretch out. It is. Uh, it is huge uh, because it helps prevent injury. And then also, 
I also do an Epsom salt bath sometimes uh, to help the muscle recover. So that is, that is huge. Uh, but yet yeah, taking care of your body and listening to your body uh, is so, so critical uh, because it just, you only have one body. You got, you got to learn how to, to back off a little bit. And sometimes you have an off day and your body says, I don't have the strength and so you call it a day. But there've been times in the gym where I either a de- whatever the deadlift or bench or squat and just, I just fell off. And I don't know, I don't push it. I, I call it a day and, and uh, say, well, I'll come back and do another day. Because there've been times, you know, you know, like we all do when we are younger, that you got to try to grind it out and you, and you may get a little bit and you push it. And then nine times out of 10, you, you overdid it and you buy it and said, okay, I told you not to do that. And then all of a sudden you come back the next day and you feel a twin and say, what happened? And you buy yeah. says, never yeah. done that. Yeah. So, so how, how does it look? How does your, what does your stretching look like? So let's say you, you walk in the gym and you do your 20 minutes of stretching or mobility before you work out. Is it more static stretching? Is it a, a particular focus on any, any type of area or more active stretching? What kind of stretching are you doing? Well, mostly, uh, I think it's more, this is static. I'm do it. It's more static stretching, but really the lower body. Uh, it's not doing a deadlift or, or a squat. You know, trying to work on the hip mobility, hip yeah. mobility, that area, that knee mobility, because it's so huge. And then if I'm doing a benching, that's a whole different, that's a whole different thing in terms of working the upper shoulders and and uh, and the tricep and bicep stuff. But yeah. but that's 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 so key for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, it's um, it makes sense, it makes absolute sense, and, and and clearly it's working for you. Do you any <laughs> the, the big the big power of this question, any cardio? Do you do any cardio on your off days at all? Is it just walking or? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, I try to do, especially on my bench days, do 20 to 30 minutes of cardio. And I, okay. I mean, not like running outside like that, but, you know, at a, the commercial gym, they have the size bike or the elliptical trainer. And so I do 20 to 30 minutes on those. Okay. Kind of keep and the heart running health. and stuff like that. You just do that for health reasons, just to stay a bit fit and healthy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's it for me. Go back. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. No. Uh, if, like when I was in the military, I would have to stop lifting for about six weeks. We do, you know, basically fitness uh, fitness tests you know, every you know, twice a year, uh, and running was hard for me because my lower back would tighten up very easily. And so if I'm lifting, it just it gets hard to do a mile and a half. An appropriate amount of time, so I would stop lifting for almost eight weeks to let the body loosen up and stretch out when I time for time for the run. Now I'm retired from the military, so I don't have to worry about that. But but uh, for me, that's the hard part of doing regular active running. So I can you know I can run a little bit, but you run long distance, I would have to really downscale my lifting to be we call a good active running. But yeah. lifting a trainer or riding a bike, I'm good on that. <laughs> yeah yeah no I find that I mean as I've I, I obviously used to do a lot of running when I was do, when I was boxing, and, and I just can't. Even at this age, I don't feel like number one, it's conducive to being a better powerlifter. But number two, you just you just don't feel like you can do it as well anymore. Um, but being on a bike, on elliptical, swimming, or something like that, I actually quite I, I don't mind doing, and I, I find it doesn't have any adverse effects whatsoever. But what I also find is that. Some powerlifters don't do any cardio or, or very minimal. And if they, if they do any work that's like above five, six reps, they're absolutely gassed. And I would feel that by being it, it would affect your lifting slightly at those kind of volumes. So maybe there is some beneficial crossover, not just for health, but for at least being relatively cardiovascularly fit. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, you, you're not you're not running you know, a marathon, a half marathon like that, but 20 or 30 minutes on a bike two or three times a week, it should be part of your overall fitness fitness scheme to, uh, to, to stay fit. And it helps with your flexibility too. So uh, I, I, think it's, I, think it's, I think it's highly ideal uh, yeah. to do a little bit of that to get the body warmed up a little bit. Yeah, no, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I agree. I agree. So... You might not even know this number, but how how many worlds have you won? Yeah, I've done. I'm uh, 
nine world championships, five-time Open, and four-time uh, uh, Masters world championships. Wow. I mean, so, I mean, most people, a lot of people will be really, really over the moon and all over social media with just one. So nine times is, is absolutely amazing. And do you know, do you know how many nationals? Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's 30 plus. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Almost, almost older than me, almost more than my age, basically. So what I'm... Um, Oh, that's absolutely crazy. It's going to get my head around that, to be honest. That's absolutely madness. Is it? What, what about going forward? Have you got... I mean, I don't know if it was always a goal of yours to compete to this age um, when you first started doing it. Did it just progress over the years and you just, you know... Like, when you were 25, 30, did you think you'd still be competing at 60? Oh, no, no. I, I thought, once you hit 30... You know, like you see these professional players there, they're kind of on the downscale of their life a little bit, maybe a bit 30. But once I hit, once I got, when I hit 30, I thought my competitive days were over. And then let alone getting 40, I thought I took some time off. I think when I was 39, when I hit 40, I thought there's no way I'd, I'd be competitive. And then I, and I started training and said, oh, I think I still got a little less in the tank. And let, I had no, I had no con, you know, conception about being 50 plus and doing this stuff. And so uh, I think the sport has evolved in terms of the level of nutrition and the equipment. You know, the, the, the equipment for raw lifting, I mean, the knee sleeves allow, has, has, a, has propelled a, a great number of athletes to be exceptional, be exceptional in the area. And it given some folks, you know, you know, who are a little older, uh, ability to, to do a little something to uh, continue their career. But I would, if you'd have told me that at you know, at age you know, 50 plus in the upper 50s, that I'll be breaking the world record, open squat record, m not one time but multiple times. Yeah, I, I would, uh, I would say what you're smoking. I, I, it's hard for me when when I talk about it. It's hard for me to think that man, did I do that? I just, uh, because when I'm doing it, when I did it, when I did that one in, in uh, at the in uh, Texas, probably was 680 something like that. I thought that was it. I, I didn't think I, I didn't ever thought that I can go any heavier than that. I thought that was it. That was the peak I can do. And I'm a 50, you know, almost close to 60. And I, there's no way I can do more than that. Yeah. Just, yeah, I know. <laughs> you're, you're, you're like a real life Benjamin Button. You're defying father time. Well, actually, you know what you're doing is, is you're breaking down barriers. Whenever an athlete does something that people don't think can be done, more people will come behind you and do it. So, you know, just a recent example would be like Eddie Hall's 500 kilo deadlift. But now, right. you know, now Hathor's done it and more and more athletes will break the 500 kilo barrier now, the deadlift barrier. Whereas, you know, doing what you're doing, you're like the, the real leader of the pack, the first one. And other people, because the sport has become so much more mainstream and popular, you'll have lifters now in their 30s and 40s and 20s, I guess, who will look at you and say, I want to do that. I want to do that shit until I'm 60 and 70. You know, this, this, this is what I want to do. So, I mean, whether that, that's something that you, you meant for or not, it's, you're, you're opening things up. And inspiring a whole generation below you. You know, you're you're doing it. You're obviously doing it for yourself and and to inspire others. But it really is opening up barriers. You know, where people thought uh, maybe I'm done by like mid to late thirties. You're thinking no, there's no, no way now. If I look after myself, I'm just going to keep going. And um, I actually listened to a podcast a couple of days ago with a, a British lifter. She's actually British champion. Um, She's an RPF lifter, Sabrina Moore. She's uh, under 63 kilo. And she actually said, when she was asked, what do you want to achieve in the sport now? She said she wants to carry on lifting until her 70s and 80s. So, you know, it's there with people. The people are, are starting to, to believe that that's something that's more and more possible. And obviously we have M3 and M4 categories. So it's great that they've, um, the federation has set it up for people to be able to do that as well, you know, and, and for people to compete at that age and at that level. Have you, 
obviously a lot of people look up to you, but have you anyone that you couple of questions here? Anyone that you have looked up to in the past or looked up look up to now? Maybe not look up to, but like uh, and maybe inspires you a little bit. Or or and rather a separate question: Is there anybody that you think on the world stage that we should be keeping an eye on? Any up and comers? Well. Uh... I mean, just recently, actually last weekend, Taylor Atwood, I was at... He oh, man. Recently. He's my guy. He's my guy, man. Woo! And so I was at that tournament. He was a local meet in Florida. We were blessed enough to have him compete. So I was one of the judges. And so he was judging the other... He was lifting at the other platform. And so we had finished. And so uh, after he squatted, he and I took a, took a picture. He said, a picture with the goat? I said, no, you, you're amazing. And so... What he had done, I mean, one thing to compete at the World Level Women World Championship, but he was the best lifter per pound at a world championship, which is, that yeah. is close the doors off. And then yeah. now he did a meet, local meet, and he just, and his lifts, if you watch his lifts, were effortless. It was not like he grinded those top lifts off. I didn't see his bench, but his squat and deadlift, he had more in the tank. Uh -huh. And so, uh, so he, he is, uh, and he's just barely in his 20s. And so he, he is phenomenal. Uh, Ashton Rushka, he's a, now he's 105. Yeah, he's big, big lifter. So he, I remember at the first, uh, he was at the Raw Nationals when I first met him in 2016, 2016, yeah, 2016. And he was just, he's still in college. He said, Mr. Ricks, Mr. Who? And he said, I just want to meet you. And, so, <laughs> and, and, uh, and he's, and you can see his left and just blowing the doors off. Now he's like you know, 105, but, but his, his phenomenal, especially his dead up, it's just it's amazing. So th those two in individuals are just really, really, uh, are just, uh, just, just, just amazing. But in terms of the chairlifting, uh, I think, you know, Jennifer Thompson, because she's closer to my, my age group, but people see, you know, hear numbers, they don't understand, uh, and they look at people and say, well, how do they do that? And you look at her genetics in terms of long arms and you know, a little tall, She's not overly muscular. And yeah. so, so for someone at that type of body framework, um, and she's been doing it, you know, for 20 plus years, that just tells you her testament in terms of her dedication in terms of lifting. Uh, it truly is uh, just, uh, uh, even for someone like myself, you step back and just like, wow, it just, it is, you're, you're amazed by that. So I, I get inspired, you know, by, you know, watching these other, these other folks lift and compete. Uh, and uh, it gives me just a, a little um, fire in the belly. So if I still have the energy, it's, and for me, it's really is, um, do I still have the capability? Now, I just don't want to just be lifting for the sake of lifting uh, and taking trophies. I want to lift for the sake of really setting personal goals and yeah. see what, I, that, that, that's what drives me in terms of my, my, my journey and whether or not I can set new personal goals because it drives, in terms of you know how 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 much energy I put into working out every day because when you have a goal and you know you're working on on a, on a goal to push yourself to a certain limit, then you will you know get up early that day. You will work hard. I mean, you will do all the little things because you have the purpose in mind in terms of what you're going to do. If you're going to just stay in shape, well, I said, well, I can sleep in a little bit, and I don't worry about doing that extra rep because I can I can do that next day. But yeah. if you know that you got to hit this number this week because next week is a is a, it's a bigger week than you than you try to do that. And so it, it changes your focus, uh, it changes your energy level of energy when you set those goals in mind. And so for me, uh, you know, like people talk about why do you lift and why do you work out? It's like everything else in terms of our mental balance because we've got this pandemic going on. It's, for me, it's my, it helps me with my mental wellness uh, to, uh, yeah. to keep balance uh, in terms of all the things going on with your work and your life until uh, your family life. And so you try to, you know, you don't want to make fitness, you know, train your whole, the whole consuming thing, but you want to, you know, have, you know, uh, just a way to kind of take a break a little bit and keep everything in balance in terms of what you do and make sure you put all the right efforts in terms of the aspects of your life, to your professional lives, in terms of your family, your work and everything else. And then fitness, you know, if you do it right, fits into a great, you know, great segment, help you with your, hopefully you set some goals and also, help you with your mental attitude in terms of what you do in life. Yeah, yeah, big time, big time. I mean, 
T training, you know, I'm, I'm under a big belief that if you can grind away, you know, you can push your body, you can train hard, you can break limits and barriers that you didn't think you could break, and you could just be consistent, you keep chipping away, you know, if you can do that in the gym, you can do that anywhere in your life, whether it's growing a business, um, whether it's, you know, bringing up a family, anything that you set your mind to do, you're, you know, you're just, every single time you hit that gym, you're toughening yourself mentally and physically. And that's so important, you know, having that, that ability to, to push your body and push your mind to new heights. Because I do believe that a lot of, you know, mental health is a problem now, huge problem, especially with men, you know, and that's not talked about enough, Young, younger males, um, and, you know, well, all males, to be honest. And by, by training hard, you're setting yourself goals and you're building up your self-esteem. And it, it's so key. You know, I, I'm, the believer, I'm a big believer that if you don't train now and you listen to this, just start. Start somewhere. You don't have to be powerlifting, but just get into the gym, set yourself some goals, whether it's losing a few pounds or, or, or you know, cracking a time, you know, a time on the treadmill to do a 5k, whatever it is, just start somewhere and you will feel so much better and other parts of your life will start coming together. I'm so glad you brought it up today because it, you know, it's so important. Training isn't just to look good. You know, that's quite a weak part of training, to be honest. It's, it's all the other aspects as well. Well, let me, at one point, you, you had, you, you actually hit, you hit the nail on the head. There is a, there's a guy at my local power gym, Wind Barbell Center, uh, Blake Bulok. Uh, he's a uh, war veteran and he lost his eyesight, you know, basically fighting for our country. And he, um, which is, a, he has a unique journey. And so he came back you know, to Florida, his wife's contact the, the local gym owner to help him train a little bit. And, and after a while, he started getting back in shape. And then Blake said, hey, I want to train for something. And so he eventually got him to train to be a competitive powerlifter. And really? so now, now he has equipment in, in his own home. He comes to the gym and he competes at these meets. And so to, to have someone who, you know, who's blind compete just like any other lifter, anyone who says, I, hey, I have some challenges. I can't get to the gym. You need to see this guy. I mean, he inspires me. Uh, and so this one local meet, you know, he was doing, uh, I think almost I think 225 kilos for a squat. And so, uh, and I told the audience, I said, you need to stand up and cheer for this guy because of his journey. And if you don't stand up and cheer, I don't know who you are, but you better stand up and, and cheer for this man. Of course, he, he had the crowd cheering and he got the lift. But when you, you see guys like, guys like that who have their own personal journey, and they overcome it, and they have a tremendous positive attitude. I said, okay, if they can do that, then, then, then it puts a, a bigger, not bigger burden, but it puts things in proper perspective in terms of what you should be doing. And yeah. you're right, that, that'll, and so you don't have to say, uh, when you write your goal, well, I wanna be a world champion. Just say, hey, my goal is to do, just like you said, I wanna you know, do actually two minutes on the trail well. I wanted to, you know, you know, do so many for so many reps. You know, very short, measurable goal. And you write, you write them down. And every week, you keep a journal. Keep yourself accountable. I write a journal. I keep a journal now. I always keep a journal and book. Now I keep it on my phone. But every every rep, every workout, I keep yeah. a, a phone journal uh, to keep track of my. So it keeps me accountable. Uh, yeah. So if I miss, I say, well, let me look back what I did a couple days ago. Oh, I missed that 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 exercise. Let me catch it for today. And so it keeps you mentally accountable, but, but, but you're right. But by having low goal, it helps your mental framework. And so one of the things that I, when I go really heavy, I think about all of some of my friends who are not with me and, and the folks who basically got some, some physical challenges. I'm honored and blessed to be able to have, you know, be able to have some weight on my back and be able to try it. And so I do it in, in celebration of those folks who would love to be in my shoes. And so I don't take anything lightly of my ability of the, of the significance of what I can do. And I just take it a day at a time. And if I'm, you know, if I get to, uh, you know, to the point where I'm lifting something heavy, even in training, I, I put myself in that mental framework is that, that there are other folks who would love to be in my shoe, be able to be able to walk to the bar and be able to just try the weight. And so yeah. that's yeah. what I, what I do. That, that, you know what, 
I don't take my health for granted one bit. I, I have a, a gratitude journal and I write in it every night. And the first thing I write every night in that journal is I'm grateful for my health. Because there's people that would love to just be able to get out of a bed or out of a wheelchair and just squat the bar, for God's sake. So, you know, it, it, you've really got to look at yourself if you're sitting there thinking, I can't be bothered to train. I haven't got the energy to train. You've got to look within yourself because... It's not about being a world champion. You're, you're being your own world champion every time you go and push yourself to do something. And you know what? If you end up, there's nothing wrong with having those goals to be a world champ. You know, I've got big goals and uh, plenty of people have got huge goals, but just keep chipping away. These things don't come overnight. Um, you know, you didn't become a world champion overnight. And now look at the history is ridiculous. Your, your accolades are absolutely outrageous now. Yeah. No, you, 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 hit, hit the, you hit the nail on the head to just keeping it very simple uh, all along that journey. And so, uh, but the mental health thing is, in these days and times, it just, it is, is the aspect of keeping everything in balance. You know, I had a, uh, did a training session for my staff. And one of the things that they, they talk about at the end of it is, is basically mental health and wellness as part of just the whole thing we're going through. And also staying, being, and being having empathy to to the people you work with, people to your family. Just sit back and listen and be uh, engaged as you do that. So you turn the phone down, you you stop and you listen to that that conversation. A lot of times they don't they don't want they don't want you to answer it. They just want you to be engaged and having that full conversation. But the other aspect is you know the wellness piece of it to kind of make sure you get yourself a little break in terms of what you want to do. And so it was refreshing that. That you know, this is coming from you know, professional talking about you know empathy and 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 how to work through a, a, a we call it a pandemic and the things that we do on a regular basis. Athletes hopefully helps us along that framework. And so yeah, yeah, man. Are you um your guy just from my own intrigue really? Your um was it Blake um your guy that lost his eyesight? Can we find him anywhere online? Does he have a social media or anything? Yeah, he, he's on Facebook. Yeah, okay. I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to him out, actually, because I'm inspired just by you telling the story. If you, um, if you link me after, actually, um, I'm inspired, actually. I'd like to check him out. Yeah, he, he, he's remarkable. So I'll, I'll send you his Facebook link. And, uh, yeah, he, he, he's remarkable. But, that, yeah. That's, a, that's amazing. Uh, I'm going to... Um, so I'm going to let you go. We, I'm going to wrap up. We've been here, like, almost an hour and a half or something now, I think. And it's been absolutely amazing. Um... Before I wrap up, I just want to cross Pat back to actually to Taylor Atwood. Um, that I watched that. That that was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, eight seventeen, eight seventeen total. I think the world were won in twenty seventeen or maybe twenty eighteen at seven forty total. I mean, what? And what? Is this this is something different. <laughs> I, I watched his squat. It was two nine three, and it was like. Yeah, then have a twenty kilo in there or something. Yeah, he, he, it, it's uh, so it, it's you know I've seen him at I saw him at nationals before, so I knew he, he was a very strong kid. Uh, and there's I mean there's a group of you know, kids at seventy four kilos that are just pushing pushing the limit. You know you know a a uh, a, uh, a two hundred seventy two squat now at seventy four kilos is not uncommon and. Uh, uh, but 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 I think he is driven by pushing to the next level. So uh, and when you're that young and that you haven't really reached your full potential, the, the challenge will be for him that he doesn't overtrain. Yeah. Because there's there's a tendency to say, oh, I get a number by the numbers. You keep pushing, you keep pushing it, and then all of a sudden your body breaks down. And so if he trains smartly, it I think I think it's gonna be amazing his potential because he. He looked like he had a little left in the tank, especially the, the dead up and, and the squat. He had, I think, a little bit. So, um, yeah, we, you know, and then uh, what's the name? Our super heavyweight, Ray Williams. Uh, yeah. I think he, he's, going, he's, got, he's on the move for a big comeback. But I remember watching him squat, you know, when he first came into the sport. Uh, it, it just, the numbers that he was squatting used to be numbers that an equipped guy would squat. Yeah. And so, yeah. I push you in a different frame of reference 
of that. And so I, I know he had that disappointment in Sweden, but I, he's going to be he's he's on the road for for a big combat. Yeah. He, he got he got he got unlucky in Sweden. There's, there's nothing you can do about those things, is there? You know, if you, if you, that those things can happen. It's just getting right. fortunate, really. Right. Um. You know, Taylor. Going back to him, he's got guys chasing him: Austin Perkins, Michael C. A. Uh, Richard Chow. He's got a few few young bucks up his backside as well. So that keeps him driven, I'm sure. Um. To you know, to be a better lifter all the time and and not get caught by those guys. What um last bit, Dave? So what what's what's it for you moving forward? Any more competitions? What's coming up? What you know? You're looking to do another world? Where, where do we want to go forward? I don't know because I mean it, it, our new our new normal is still evolving, and <laughs> so yeah. I'm not sure what my next meet is going to be. I mean, if they are going to have a world, whatever, and we're not a being cheap for that. So uh, and uh, so we'll, we'll we'll take a I'll take it day by day in terms of what's coming out there, but definitely I, right now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like downshifting in terms of my heavy lifting. I'm doing a lot of, you know, you know, a lot of more flexibility, high rep stuff, let my body kind of recover. And then probably this summer, I'll start doing a little bit of heavy lifting, kind of see where I'm at and then see what, you know, what the future holds in terms of major events, in terms of what, what I might, what I might try to do. Uh, because for me, this is, I mean, if you look at my career, you can say I, I, I could drop the mic and call, call it a day and I don't need to do anything else. Uh, but I'm, I'm always inspired to keep pushing myself when I see other folks like, you know, especially like Jennifer Thompson and Taylor Awood and some other folks. And they said, hey, you're still the guy. I said, well, I don't know about that. But, but it, it keeps me inspired to keep doing what I'm doing. But, but I have to deal with a grain of salt to see whether or not my body is going to allow me to do that. And so yeah. I'm fortunate enough, blessed enough, to do that thing in, in Colorado in September, because I wasn't sure what I was going to do when that was one rep or three reps. And that was actually a, a PR to, PR squat in terms of reps. And that, when I finished, like, after, after a week later, I said, did I, did I do what I thought I did? <laughs> and so I had <laughs> sometimes because I didn't know what I did in terms of comprehending in terms of what I did that day. But it was, but the energy level was off the chart. So it really got me inspired push yourself when you got people around you very positive people uh on the same mindset you can really you can really push your limits a little bit i mean safely so yeah man dave i mean my man it's been a pleasure having you on and you are not dropping the mic anytime soon i'm gonna if i have to fly to america and super glue that mic to you to keep us all inspired i'm gonna do that so listen just we want you to carry on as long as possible. Keeps me inspired. I'm always tracking your stuff um, online. And uh, you're an inspiration to me and the others, brother. So, you listen, it's been great having you on. Um, do you want to shout out anyone or plug, um, your, plug your Instagram, plug your social media, your team longevity stuff for me before before we go? What, what's your handle? Yeah, well, I'm rich.david, and uh, so I'm on Instagram. But before I finish, I want to give a shout out to my wife. We've been together almost 40 years, married for 39. And so like everything else in success in life, uh, you can't do it by yourself. And my wife has been my driving force. She's a 10-year cancer survivor. So she's truly wow. my superhero regardless. And so and she keeps the family straight. And, and I got a you know, grandchild. I got a son. Uh, and so those are really my, my two successes in life. But again, my wife of over 40 years, we years this month that we first met and, and then we got, we got engaged three months later, we got married nine months later. And so, and we're still, still together almost four Amazing. years. And so that's truly, I consider my, 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 my biggest success in life, me and my wife. So. Amazing, man. Amazing. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up as well. Cause fam, family is, uh, family is everything. And uh, that obviously keeps you driven as well to, um, you, you know, you've got responsibilities and it keeps you driven, but um, dude, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put your Instagram handle for Team Longevity and your personal one in the show notes. Um, and guys, please, please reach out. Do you do any coaching, Dave? I do. I do some online coaching. If someone wants to do that, just send me a note and we'll, we'll have that conversation. So, uh, but, but I appreciate, you know, when, when I, I'll just do one more thing. When I uh, left the sport in 2014, uh, I thought I was done. You know, I had some, you know, some, some work stuff to figure out. And so I didn't think I'd be back lifting again. And so, and then, you know, now it's, you know, 
is almost six years, yeah, six years later, I'm having this conversation, winning a couple more world titles, setting some world records. <laughs> if you told me that when I left the sport in 2014, and after being on the sport for nine months and, and having those numbers in my first meet back, I said, no, I don't think so. That's way, that's way beyond regular goals. And so I would say that you never know what your potential is. And like you said earlier, to take it day by day, your, your, up, your, your ceiling is almost unlimited. And, and, you, and you, when you look back upon what you, where you're at to where you're at today, you'd be amazed in terms of your journey, but you got to start somewhere and you got to keep yourself accountable. Yeah, amazing, man. You're an inspiration, my man. And um, listen, look after yourself. Stay safe, because I know that um, the whole COVID thing is still quite quite bad out in America um, at the moment in certain parts. So stay safe there as well. And um, yeah, just keep keep on inspiring us. All right. Talk to you later. Thank you. Take care, my man. All right.